Anybody want to jump in, though, with a quick comment right now? Anything important? I mean, I'm sure it's all important. Anything you think other people might be interested in? <laughs> okay. Issues? Challenges? Yeah, a few. <laughs> no kidding. A few. A few challenges. Yeah, I mean, on the training, let me just say a couple words about that. We're being challenged now to help states develop whole statewide training programs. I mean, and this is not a small matter. And in some states, incidentally, and I don't know if this is the case in your states, but in Illinois and in New York, for sure that I know of, they have, in their law, it says, if you're going to evaluate teachers in this state, you've got to pass a test. Well, you've got to be certified. Now, in Illinois, they're specifying it has to be a real demonstration. In New York, they, all the legislation says is you have to be certified somehow or other. So, um, now, I don't know what the situation is in your states, but, you know, it makes sense. I mean, when a teacher says, my principal doesn't know what he's doing, I mean, they have a point. They have, and we can't afford that. We just can't afford that. So, anyway, I, I, think, I think it's... it's the minute this becomes high stakes, then we have to take seriously evaluator training. And we just have to. I mean, there's no, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, it's really more a question. Because go ahead. I, I agree with that point. Now. Okay. The question I had was just in the next study, can you give an example of the um, amount and time it takes to get a trainer to that Sure. Question? Yeah, yeah, no. Like, that's a great question. How much time does it take? to actually, for an evaluator to get to a reasonable standard of. What we do in the Danielson group for training, we do three days face-to-face -face training. Uh, one, in, and this is, by the way, the, oh, you see, the other thing you have to bear in mind here, this is instrument-specific, Yes. right? That is, and so the only training we do is training on my framework. If you're using something else, you have to do training on that. And it takes, it's actually pretty, demanding and time-consuming to develop the training program. So that's one advantage of it. those people who are using my framework, that work is done. But in any case, if, if you were to do that, we do a three-day face-to-face training on an introduction to the framework and then on observation skills, um, two days of that. That's very good training. It does not get you to the point where you would pass a test, however. But it's very good and it's a good place to start. Now we can also train trainers like in a state, so you can build capacity that way. But then you have to build in more time for them. And I'm actually a little ambivalent about train the trainer models, only because it's really hard to get good at enough at something to train it when it's new to you. So that's the, but we also, uh, we, I've worked with a couple of companies to develop some online stuff, and we've developed a facilitator's guide to, to for that. That's a pretty good way to go, too, because then you can train somebody as a facilitator to, to do this program with other people. They don't have to be the expert. I'm on the video. So people, you know everybody's hearing the same thing. But, um, but, but you know, you can spread it around more quickly. And then there's this stuff from TeachScape. That, that company is called Educational Impact. And by the way, in the slides, and you can get a copy of these, there's a list of these companies that I've been working with. Um, and the TeachScape stuff is also... Um, very good. And, and they have other stuff too, by the way, other tools for observation, other like walkthroughs and stuff like that. Things on an iPad. I mean, that's another issue. It takes time to do this stuff well. So, like, shortcut tools are, are useful. Anyway, their online training, though, is, is going to be available, and the test is going to be available in mid October. So, it's, it, we're in the middle of it right now. But it, and that's very good. We know it's good because of the MET work. So, anyway, that, but that's the kind of effort you're talking about. You're talking several days of face-to-face -face training or facilitated online training in some manner, and then, um, and, and then some serious work on calibration and on accuracy of judgment. And of course, that's where the rubber hits the road, is there. But the good news is we know we can do it. The I have to tell you, though, I've done a lot of work with principals over the last few years. It's a deer-in-the-headlight situation. <coughs> You know, I mean, when we were, when I was working with the state of Delaware years ago to design their statewide evaluation system, and they put together a great committee. It was people from the department, from the administrators group, from the union, um, and it was a group of maybe 10 or 12 people. 
And, and I was thrilled, of course. I thought, this is so exciting. You know, a whole state is using my way now. Admittedly, it's a small state. But still, <laughs> a whole state. <laughs> anyway, one of the principals on the committee would say every now and then, we were designing this system, and she would, every now and then she'd say something like, you know, this is a really good system we're coming up with, but you know what? It's going to take a lot longer than what I'm doing now. Well, given that what she was doing now was approximately zero, this is <laughs> I mean, this is not something that people have taken seriously. I have an administrative credential. I must have taken a course called Supervision and Instruction. I couldn't tell you a thing that was in it. I know it wasn't about this. So we're starting with a low, you know, a low capacity. And most states were being told, do it tomorrow. So everybody's got to crank up. And it's not though, as though we shouldn't be doing it well. We should. It's important. But, you know, it's, go ahead. Just a quick follow-up. Okay. Has anybody gone through the, you know, Texas has had the pre-licensing review. Right. Years. But we don't allow any of the Texas people, black people, or anything like they I, I don't doubt it. Yeah, well, you've got a thousand districts, that. right? You've got a thousand districts. Yeah, but I mean, just has anybody done this or... The, you know, the auditing? The audit, yeah. Auditing. No, but you see, this video technology is going to make that possible. You see, that is, you could, like, let's say I'm a principal, and I go to observe a class, and I, and I do it, and I sort of rate it, right? We could videotape that same class, send my judgments and the videotape to somebody somewhere else who could compare them. Now, that's labor-intensive, very labor-intensive, but it's, it is possible. It's possible. I don't know any. I don't know any non-labor intensive way, frankly, to do auditing. I mean, I think that's the nature of it. It's labor intensive, and in a way, that's what state departments of ed should be doing: is is, is doing quality control on the system. So let me just um, just press on here and say that there are basically two effective two two approaches to defining effective teaching. One is on assessing teacher practices. That is how well teachers do the work of teaching. That's been my work up to now. In fact, that's been all of our work up to now, right? But in the last, what, year and a half, two years, all of a sudden people have said, you know, we should also evaluate teachers based on the results they get with kids, how well kids learn. And you know, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to argue that point. I mean, it is why we have schools, after all, for kids to learn. Right? I don't know a single teacher or even union activist who would say that the second bullet point up there is irrelevant. The question is what counts as evidence, and how do you attribute that to an individual teacher? And how do you control for all the out-of-school stuff that, and which we know matters, by the way. It matters a little more than the value-added people would have you believe. But I am no expert on this. You have some experts in the room, so I'm going to leave that part aside. But let me just say one thing here. I don't think there's anybody on the planet who has figured out how to do this. And I'll tell you my evidence for that statement, they're calling me. <laughs> if I'm their best hope, I know we're in trouble. I mean, the scenario you just painted of, you know, 50% of this, I, that assumes that you can go 0.5 times something plus 0.5 times something else is something. I don't know a single, not one term of that equation. It assumes it's numbers. Now, I'd like to do better than numbers. I mean, this is virgin territory. I can only say don't try it at home, especially the, the second one of these. I mean, these are very complicated things. Well, I'll say one more thing. It's my belief, and the belief of every psychometrician I've ever talked about this, which I am not one of, by the way. I do hang out with them. Some of it rubs off. But I'm no expert in this field. But um, the, the standard, any standardized test measures, whether they're state tests or commercially available ones, are inadequate to attribute scores to individual teachers for a whole host of reasons. They're very unstable, the ends are small, a, a whole host of measurement reasons. You've got Laura here, you've got other people who really know this work, they can, they can help you here. I mean, if there's help to be had, they can help you. I'm not the, I'm not the one. Um, so it, they are, it's a, it's a flawed model we have, you know? And now, there are alternatives. I mean, if I teach fourth grade, and let's say you're my principal, I ought to be able to convince you my kids have learned something. Like, we didn't just do pizza parties all year. The 
question is, what's the evidence? Well, writing samples from September and May, that might be show, I hope. <laughs> or, I mean, um, so I think, it, the, I think the best evidence, the most best quality evidence is very close to the classroom. And, it's, and it shows student work. Now, that doesn't lend itself to numbers or to large-scale management. It's, but I think it's the right way to go. And it has the enormous advantage of, if, say, let's say we're a group of now fourth grade teachers. We have to talk to each other. We have to look at student work from all of our classrooms, figure out what's, you know, what, what, what does quality writing look like, and so on. That's good work. That's good work. Anyway, OK. I'll let other people deal with the testing issues. Oh, let me say one more thing. Let's suppose we're a bunch of algebra teachers, and we've designed an end of the course, an end of the course exam. Let's say one year we give this test and my kids don't do as well as all of yours do. And I should, you know, that's important information. It may or may not be significant, however, because of the vagaries, right? But if year after year after year my kids don't do as well as yours do, that might be a performance issue. So we're talking patterns. The, we, you have to look at at least three years of data for even good data. Anyway, so. But there are, there are big issues there, which, as I say, I don't think anybody on the planet has really figured that. But you see, that doesn't stop the legislators. <laughs> right? I mean, it doesn't. And they, and they're, I mean, I, I don't question their motives. I think they're well-intentioned. They're just ignorant. So then, then you have to hope that they're open to being educated. And by people they would trust, they don't think are just self-serving, don't, don't want to be accountable, right? That's the problem with unions. They don't, they tend to not be you know, trusted, basically. So, but you folks, I think, are probably in the best position to try to convince your, your legislator, your committees, but anyway, uh, it's, this is, this is going to be, if we can just get through the next two or three years, I think we'll hopefully be in a better place. I, I really do worry that some of this is going to hit the fan, actually, pretty quickly, because I don't think anybody's developed good systems yet, because we don't know how yet. We're making it up. You're making it up. Okay, but we do know some stuff about teacher practices, so let's talk about that. <clears throat> okay. Oh, I'm going to skip this. You can, you, well, no, let's just, you know, there's two approaches to uh, teacher practices, right? You can either do it internally, which is what we always do, site administrators, or external, like national board, right? So now, we tend to do internal, as, as we should uh, in general, but that your question about the external auditing um, raises the, the option of doing something on video and sending it somewhere. And I know some little private schools, for example, in remote places where they really don't have the capacity. They want to, they want to contract out the whole thing. Um, but, but most large schools, they try to do it internally. But that means building capacity there. And, and that's good work. It's important work. But that's what it means. OK. All right, let's talk about what good teachers do. Now, I'd like you to think about this question for just a minute. If you were to walk into a classroom, what might you see or hear there? a student or the teacher that would cause you to think you're in the presence of an expert? What would cause you to think, whoa, this is good. If I had a kid this age, I'd want him here. Okay. Think about that for one minute or 30 seconds. Because you see, we all have a vision in our head, an answer to that question, right? There's no earthly reason why it should be the same. So I'd like you to just think about this for 30 seconds, whatever pops into your head, and you know, it can be more than one thing, right? And then just quickly do a share around the table and see if you've got the same thing. It's important to establish this point about how important this is. So take Let me ask you a quick question first. Did you find you sort of agreed with each other? Yes? Good. That's good. Let me ask you for one important idea then that came out. What was the first big idea? Engaged. Students are engaged. Great. How many people had something like that? Okay, now I'm going to guess that when you said the students are engaged, you weren't just thinking busy. So then that becomes an interesting conversation. What's the difference between engagement and busy? We could, do, we could spend the rest of the day on that. And we do a lot of that in training because it's important to know what it looks like. Now, let me just also point out one other sort of obvious thing. And I don't mean this in a critical way. The answer that students are engaged does not actually, strictly speaking, answer the question. Right? That is, what you see, actually see and hear is students leaning forward, raising their hands, right? You see them doing some things and saying some things and the teacher, etc. But what you, what you are doing automatically, and we all do this, you're interpreting it. 
you are interpreting that as engagement. And you're probably right. It's just that you should be aware that that's what it is you're doing. Now, when we do training, that's, that's a large part of what we do, is what do you actually see in here? What's the actual evidence? And how do you interpret that evidence, first of all, as to which component of the framework it is and what level of performance it is? And furthermore, you have to have a lot of evidence in order to interpret fairly. Okay, I don't want to belabor this point, but, and we could, of course, spin this out and find out what else you had identified in answer to this question, but the point is that when people answer that question, they tend to come up with things that are in my framework for teaching. And the centerpiece of it is in domain three, an in instruction, uh, and it's, uh, wherever it is, engaging students in learning. That's the centerpiece. It's kind of buried, but it's the centerpiece of the whole framework. Everything else is in service to that. So you can see what we have so here. So now, let me say, if you, as you can see, these 22 things are divided into these four major domains. There are 22 of the components. Let me say a few words about these. First of all, this is a framework for teaching, not a framework for school librarians, nurses, counselors, etc. Now, those people are typically part of the teacher bargaining unit. Oh, you have bargaining units. Um, but their jobs are different. They need their own frameworks. Now, in the second edition of the framework book, which came out in 2007, I did create rubrics and you know, frameworks for those non-classroom specialist positions. And they follow the same architecture, but they're specific to each one. And I drew on the expertise of their professional organizations to, uh, to create those. But you know, they, they would, I offer them as a sort of first draft, because I've never done any of those jobs. And so I'm sort of doing the best I can, but you should know that's what it is. But this is much more highly evolved. It's been evolving over whatever it's been since 1996. It's gotten better. Um, now, but let me say a few words about it. First of all, it is research-based, seriously research-based. That is, every item on here has a research foundation. And there's a chapter in the book devoted to that, just so you know. But in more importantly, and this is much more recent, the, the framework as a whole has been validated. Not only base validity, that is, educators, experts who know their, the work come up with this stuff, but predictive validity. In the, sense, in the sense that when teachers are evaluated using this framework, the ones who's, who are evaluated highly, their students perform and grow more than students of teachers who perform poorly on this. Now that's an enormously important claim to be able to make, and it's a recent claim. And in fact, the, the most conclusive study on that isn't even published yet, but it will be in the next month, I think. They're checking their data, but, but it's very powerful. It, it was done by the uh, Consortium for Chicago School Research, CCSR, uh, and part of the University of Chicago. They do really, they're top research group. And, and, you know, I'm really delighted. I mean, I heaved a sigh of relief, obviously, when I read that. But, but I'm also, it's really important that it be some external person, right? I mean, who would believe it if I did the study like that? They'd say, well, a researcher says her oh, who <laughs> You'd be right not to believe it. I'd have, a, I'd have an interest, right, in having that conclusion. So it's really important that it be an external group. And there have been other studies, by the way, smaller scale ones. But it's, it's hard research to do. You need longitudinal data and so on. But, just, but I just want you to know that, that that is powerful and positive and strong research validating this instrument. It, the instrument itself, by the way, has undergone some revision, largely based on what we've learned in the MET study, when we found that it was initially it was really hard to train people to acceptable levels of integrator agreement. We've done some tweaking. I've created some additional tools and so on. All that's going to be freely available. And that's what will be embedded into the TeachScape stuff, and probably others as well. So, I'm, I mean, I have no problem giving that away. I, I have, there's no reason to hold on to it. But it'll be dated. <laughs> it'll be dated because we keep finding ways to improve it, and as we should. This is an evolution. Okay. So, it's research-based and validated. Um, what else can I say? Um, it... Well, it's grounded in some assumptions. Now, any such document would be grounded in assumptions about the nature of learning, student learning, and the nature of professionalism. Most people just don't make those assumptions explicit. I did, because I know how important they are. Because you, you, if you don't accept the assumptions, you're not going to like the framework, basically. But let me tell you what those assumptions are. There's one about the nature of student learning. And it, 
It sounds almost dumb to say it because it seems so obvious. And yet Robin alluded to it actually earlier. Cognitive psychologists, you probably know, don't agree on everything, right? But here's one thing they do agree on about, about learning, human learning. Learning is done by the learner through an active intellectual process, period. Now, if you really sort of understand and accept that, you don't have to understand much more. But again, it sounds sort of dumb to say that, right? Learning is done by the learner. Yeah, right. It, it is. So, therefore, when I observe in a classroom, of course I notice what the teacher's doing, but I also really notice what the kids are doing. Because we think as teachers that our kids learn on account of what we do. And actually, we now know that that's not quite right. Our kids don't learn on account of what we do. They learn on account of what they do. That's where the learning is. That's why we've got to get that part right. And so I define teaching, actually, as that which causes learning. It's not about what I actually do so much, although these are the things that tend to produce learning. Right? So it's, it's, this, it's this sort of intersection of student and teacher actions. But that's the, that's the reason. That's the assumption. Now, there's also an assumption about teaching as professional work. Now, we've always known that teaching is demanding physical work. I mean, you run around a lot, you're up and down upstairs, but people are tired at the end of the day. I, I, can any of you actually remember your first year or two of teaching? <laughs> I've repressed it. <laughs> so, this is really hard work. We've always known that it's demanding emotional work. And I'm pretty sure the more caring a person is, the more demanding. Okay, but here's what we've learned more recently. Teaching is also challenging intellectual work. Teachers make hundreds, I mean literally, people have counted this, hundreds of decisions a day, often under what we would have to call unfavorable circumstances, like in a hurry, based on incomplete information. And yet you have to make it, you have to commit to do this activity after lunch. You just learned that three kids are absent, take some setup, the science say, science lesson. What you don't know is it might be worse tomorrow. There might be six kids absent tomorrow. You can't know that now. But, you, but they're coming in two minutes. You've got to decide. OK. This goes on all day long with teaching. This, in, in other words, teaching is a thinking person's job. Right? Now, that's, this has enormous implications for anybody whose job it is to support teachers. If we really accept that teaching is demanding cognitive work, and I think we have to accept that, then the conversations we have about teaching must be about the cognition. How did you decide to do X rather than Y? Have you ever tried Y? What happened? What, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's about the thinking and decision making. That's a very different way of imagining teacher evaluation than I'm coming in to inspect. It's a very different way of thinking about it. But in order for it to actually have any benefit for the teachers, it has to be done. OK, let me just say one, two more things, I guess. <clears throat> I'd like to point out that there's nothing on this list that is unusual. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. There is one that's a little unusual, though, and it's, it's here, the establishing a culture for learning. Now, that one is based, it's in domain two, it's about the environment. It is based on this observation that there are, in many schools, typically high schools, middle schools, there is a culture among at least some students that it's not cool to be smart. It's not cool to actually care. It's not cool to work hard. I mean, this is a culture thing. Now, I was once doing a workshop in a high school uh, on something unrelated to this, student assessment maybe. And, and we were in the library. It's nice, actually not unlike this. We work on the floor, adult-sized tables and chairs. You know, very nice. On one wall were photographs of students. It must have been gone back 25 years, one a year. And it said, athlete of the year. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against sports. I know this is why some kids come to school, right? In some towns, the Friday night game brings the entire community together. I know this. In my personal life, one of my own kids is a world, or has been a world level competitor. I mean, representing the United States, I mean, that's very cool for a kid, right? I added, I'll confess, it's cool for the kid's mom. <laughs> but, 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 I'm sure you can hear there's a big butt working in here, right? I, so I was in this workshop doing with these high school teachers, and, we, and I, I admired, actually, the recognition of, of the kids. And I said, but you know, I've got a question. Where do you have the poet of the year? 
where have you got the inventor of the year? And by the way, when you've designated the poet of the year, hang those pictures in the gym. It's just a thought. We've got the athletes in the library. Why not? Now, you know, I'm not naive. I know we live in a celebrity culture. Who are the celebrities? The athletes and the entertainers. I know this. But you know what? If we can't have a culture for learning in a school, where on earth would we have it? I mean, really, right? Where on earth would we have it? So this is not trivial. Now, cultural changes take time. They are slow. They are slow. Those things I've just been mentioning are school-wide cultural issues. But every teacher has a part to play, which is why it's in this framework for teaching. Every teacher has a part to play to convey to the kids that what we're doing here is important. Furthermore, it's actually kind of fun, et cetera. Right? OK, so that's the issue around culture for learning. And, and so I've actually identified what that means. There are a couple of elements to it, and, and you'll see. Um, and then there's one last thing I want to say here. I wouldn't want you to think that I think that because of these aspects of teaching are listed separately, they're described separately, I wouldn't want you to think that I think that teachers do them separately. I'm, I'm no better than that, right? It's very intertwined and entangled. And in fact, this is an interesting activity to do with, with teachers. Pick any one. Like, let's say, questioning and discussion techniques, right? If a teacher were good at questioning and discussion, what else would that same teacher have to be good at in order to be good at that? Well, they have to know their content, right? They'd have to know their kids. What's an appropriately challenging question for this group or this individual? What about, in, I'd have to be clear what my instructional outcomes are. If I'm running a discussion, I need to know where I want that to go, what I want the kids to learn from it. There will be things over in domain two, like an environment of respect. It needs to be safe. Kids need to feel it's a safe place to take an intellectual risk. There will be this culture for learning that it's important. There are classroom procedures. Do you raise your hand? Do you not? Right. So I'm sure you get the point here. So then the question becomes, well, why do it this way? Why list them all out in these little pieces? And here's, here's my answer to that, and I think, it's, I think it's a good answer, actually. I think of this as, as an analogy to a, a theater in the round. Now, think of a theater in the round. You've got your play right in the middle. Think of the lesson like the play. And because it's a theater in the round, the audience is sitting all around. Because the audience is sitting all around, the lights have to come from all directions. I think of these things like the lights. Here's the lesson, but let's just focus on the questioning skills, on the interactions, right, on the procedures. And when you think of it that way, then this framework becomes just an analytic tool. And that's all it is. It's a way to analyze practice. OK, so. So, and that's why I think then this framework becomes an analytic tool for anybody to use, teachers, absolutely, right? As well as, of course, coaches, mentors, and supervisors. So, it's a way to get some common understanding about what is good teaching and, and then be able to have conversations about it. Now, let me ask you to do one more thing. Um, when I asked you earlier, like this question, what do you see in here, you might have thought of something that you don't see here. And I'd just be really curious. You're not going to hurt my feelings, by the way. I'd, like to, I'd just be curious to know if you thought of something that you don't see on this, in this framework. And please don't be bashful. Just jump in with something. And if I can tell you what a few people have said. They said, well, where's technology? Gone missing? Is that what you thought? Where's uh, high expectations? There's a lot of research about that. Well, there are those items. I call them common themes or seven of them. There might actually be more that I haven't thought of that are embedded. But these common themes are aspects of teaching. They are not identified as components of teaching. These are components. They're not identified as components, not because they're not important. They are. But the components, the components describe what teachers do. The common themes describe the manner in which teachers do what they do. So for example, a teacher who holds high expectations for student learning, those high expectations will be reflected in the outcomes they set, they'll be at a high and challenging level. At the questions they pose, they'll be at a demanding intellectual level. At the feedback they give to students, they'll be on the expectation of high-level learning, as will the communication with families. Right? So the common themes, high expectations and all the others, they, they are pervasive through the framework. They, each of them applies to more than one. 
I don't think any of them applies to all. But that is also a very interesting conversation to have with educators. Like, which ones apply to which? Right? And, 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 and the question is not even which ones apply to which, but how. That becomes the important question. Like, where does, where's technology important? And how? And how? Again, no right answers, but very interesting. Um, interesting. Now, I'd like to say one more final word about the assumptions issue around, around students that's embedded in this framework. I said about student learning. I'd also like to say another quick word about motivation. That, um, I don't know exactly how to say this. I don't know about you. I have never known an intellectually lazy four-year-old. No, I can't speak for you, but I mean, think of the four-year-olds you've known, right? They are at it, right? I have known a lot of intellectually lazy 14-year-olds. Now, granted, a lot goes on between 4 and 14, but one of the things that happens is they go to school. I would hate to think that we play a part in switching off the lights, but I think we better look at that. Now, if you ask a kid who doesn't like school, why not? Have you ever heard a kid say it's because it's too hard? What do they say? We know this. It's boring. We know this. What's that about? Right? Now, have you ever watched a kid learn to play this, uh, to skate on a skateboard? They keep at it, right? They will risk, sometimes endure, physical injury in order to get good at that. I have never seen them apply that same kind of perseverance and drive to fractions. <laughs> Somehow we need to figure this out. That, and we know this from the psychology literature, by the way that mastery and command of difficult concepts is very energizing. It's highly motivational. We have, to, we have to use that fact. To get it right is very satisfying, just like it is to ride the skateboard. But that doesn't tend to be how we teach. We tend to teach as sort of pebble, right? teaching procedures. Here's how you do that. Watch me while I show you how to do this problem. Struggle a little bit. Figure it out. The countries that are eating our lunch for in international assessments, they teach it more in that way. Here's a problem. See if you can figure it out. How did you do it? And you do it, and you do it. And what's, is there a best way? And it's, it's very problem-based. And the kids have to, and of course, struggle a little bit. That's part of learning. Anyway, that's my own little philosophy. It's embedded in this. Because, because that's part of intellectual engagement, actually, you see. Intellectual engagement is not just filling in a worksheet. It's not, it's not just being busy. It's, it's intellectually working. <laughs> okay, let's press on here a little bit. Uh, now, each of these things, by the way, in the book has a narrative description and then a, um, a, a rubric. It looks like this, a level of performance. And let me say a few words about this. This happens to be the environment of respect and rapport. There are two critical elements, teacher interaction with students and student interaction with each other. And let me say a few words about these levels of performance. The unsatisfactory level. I don't know, you all work in licensing, you know this. There's a concept in licensing called do no harm, right? You can drive your car across a bridge, it probably won't collapse under you. It was designed by a licensed engineer, right? This building almost certainly won't collapse. It was designed by a licensed architect. I mean, that's what the license means. It's the state's guarantee to the unwitting public, in this case us, we won't come to harm as a consequence of this person's work. Now, there's nothing in the licensing procedure for architects that says the building must be beautiful, as is evident if you look around you. But there, it's not a fast that. It's merely safety. That's what a license to teach is. It's the state's guarantee to the public that children, students, will not come to harm in this person's classroom. I wrote these statements at the unsatisfactory level. I wrote them deliberately below that standard. There's harm being done. Or learning is being shut down. Or the environment is chaotic. So if supervisors encounter practice at that level, in my view, this is intervention time. We have to protect the kids. We can't permit harm. Now, the other, so therefore, there should be a thick line here between unsatisfactory and basic. The others are degrees of good. They're degrees of good. And admittedly, not very good at the basic level. Um, but now, these are levels of performance of teaching, not of teachers. And that's an important distinction. 
Um, but the basic level descriptors, I, in fact, when I first wrote this book and had submitted it to ASCD, they already knew they wanted to publish it, but they sent it out for review. I actually at that point called that novice. Because that's sort of who I had in mind. People who are new to this hard work, they're doing everything for the first time, and guess what? It doesn't go as planned. And they don't have a plan B. Right? They're brand new. Everything, and so they're making it up as they go along. They, if, if they do an activity that's not working well. They don't have a, they have to soldier on, even though it's not going very well. So, and this is, this is just constantly part of being a new teacher. We, we all experience that. Our, our aim as a system, though, is to help people get through that as quickly as possible. It's an inevitable stage of learning to teach. But, but that's why we need good mentoring programs, right, to help people through that quickly. Now, proficient level performance is good, solid, professional teaching. It's people who know their subject. Or typical, you know, they, or, or they know their kids also, or typical 14-year-olds, right? And they, they have a repertoire of strategies and all that. They have eyes in the backs of their heads. <laughs> they know in the lunchroom, don't sit in that chair, Mrs. Jones will eat you for lunch. Um, they know all that informal stuff, how to get copies run, how, to, how decisions get made, all that. So they're, they've been here before, they're good, solid teachers. Distinguished level practice is different in kind. And in, and in classroom performing at that level, the students have assumed, well, first of all, the common themes all play out at our level, but then the students assume a lot of responsibility for what goes on. And the teacher has created a community of learners. In fact, you walk into a classroom that's functioning at that level, and <coughs> It actually looks sort of easy. It looks like the teacher's not really doing anything. We know this is not magic. <laughs> it's hard work to set it up and get it going, which is why, by the way, you're more likely to see high level performance in May than you would have been in September. So it takes a while to get that community going. Um, let's, and so you have to be cautious about it. I think these levels of performance are enormously helpful, certainly for professional development and also for evaluation. But I urge you and implore you, don't take a rigid and formulaic approach. Some places look at this and they say, oh, OK, I get it. <clears throat> there's 22 components. There's four levels of performance. Let's call them 1, 2, 3, 4. We'll evaluate performance, add them up, divide by 22, and you have to have a 2.75 or something. Please. Um, I mean, national board adds. I guess that's defensible. I know multiplying and dividing is not. These are not equidistant points on a psychometric scale. You just can't divide them. And it, it, anyway. But it's not to say they're not useful. However, you have to think about extenuating circumstances. Let's say I'm a fifth grade teacher. I've been doing it, you know, 10 years. I'm good. And I perform pretty regularly at a high level proficient on some days, even distinguished levels. Especially, I should add, I even hesitate to say this, but I think we have to acknowledge it. Especially if there's a, two, a particular two kids who are absent. <laughs> we shouldn't pretend this isn't true. I mean, let's call it for what it is, right? There are some kids, through no fault of their own, they, they bring a tremendous amount to school with them in the way of baggage, right? And so it's harder for them, and they may dis be disruptive, and, and et cetera. But let's even ignore that for a moment and say, OK, I've been teaching fifth grade. Now, now I'm assigned a second grade class. Oh, boy. I don't know that curriculum. I don't know how second graders think. I don't know their sense of humor. I hardly have any knock-knock jokes. You know, I've got work to do before I will be as good at second grade as I would have been had I stayed at fifth. I will probably actually perform at a basic level for a little while for the same reason a new teacher would. Well, I am, in fact, a new teacher in second grade. Right? So, so, what that says is if you're going to evaluate performance in a consequential manner, you have to figure out a way to attend to these kinds of situations. Good luck. I mean, I really don't know how you do it, except to have a judgment about it being good enough performance and exemplary performance that takes into account the fact that somebody's a new teacher or they have had a change of assignment. Because it's not smart to penalize teachers for being flexible. I mean, why would that be a good idea? Right? So I would just urge you to sort of keep that in mind and have your districts keep it in mind as they're designing things. Okay, I need, need to say a few more things. And I'm going to start running out of time here. So this framework, I, I've talked about most of this. 
It's research. It's I try to do all of it. It's coherent and it's structured. That just means there's four domains, 22 components, smaller elements. I'll say one thing about the last item, that it's independent of any particular teaching methodology. You know, we are a faddish profession. You know this, right? These initiatives come and go. Well, they actually, they never seem to go. They just keep coming. We had cooperative learning and learning styles and brain hemisphericity and multiple intelligence. And now, I'm not mocking these things, by the way. They're good. They're good. We learn from them. And in fact, they're actually kind of seductive. I mean, if I teach, I can read a book or go to a workshop on, let's say, cooperative learning and think, wow, this is powerful. I should be doing everything this way. Well, no, actually. I don't know about you. I've been in plenty of classrooms where kids are working in groups and they are learning nothing. They are sharing their ignorance. <laughs> I mean, the question is not whether you are learning is a powerful strategy. The answer to that question is yes. That's not the right question. The question is under what conditions, for what purposes. And that, that's why teachers need a repertoire and to know when to do what. That's why teaching is a thinking person's job. Right? It's to do with this. Okay. Um, now, I, we need to talk a minute about professional learning. We're running out of time. So let's just think for a second. Now, I'm going to say something that sounds so dumb, but I have to say it. Professional learning is learning. Duh, you might say. But, you know, we can apply everything we know about learning to What's the main thing we know about learning? Learning is done by the learner through an active intellectual process. Now, let me just remind you of how we typically do an observation. Let's say you're the principal, I'm the teacher. You come to my class, you watch me teach. You take notes, you go away, you write up your notes, you come back, you tell me about my teaching. And I would only ask you, who's doing the work? What am I doing? Nothing. Well, I'm teaching my class. I am under contract to do that. But for this process, what am I doing? Zip. Oh, and actually it gets worse. Now we are in your office and we're talking about this lesson. I know that from the standpoint of that conversation, all I actually have to do is endure it. You will eventually stop talking and I can leave. <laughs> really, I mean, think about that. So, so should we be surprised that teachers don't actually learn anything from this? Well, no. Actually, we sh that's exactly what we should expect for the reason that they're not doing anything. So what that means is then that if you want to have, if you want to design a system that's actually worthwhile for teachers, you have to embed in what we know about professional learning. Well, first of all, it happens in an environment of trust. Fear shuts people down, period. Which means that for probationary teachers, we are already in trouble. Because they are vulnerable and they know it. Which means they're almost certainly going to learn more from their mentor or other colleagues than they will from their principal. That's just... That's just the way it is. Okay. But for more experienced teachers, we can absolutely, and even for beginners, we can embed as many of these things into the processes as possible, such as self-assessment, reflection on practice, and professional conversation and cooperation within, within a culture of professional inquiry. So now let's think about how do you do that? That's pretty standard teacher observation embedding those principles. Well, all right, here's a lesson. Those starry dots represent everything that happened. If it were really a lesson, there'd be hundreds of them. Now, I'm going to be the observer now. And I'm looking for evidence of respect and rapport. Not one we just looked at. So let's say I, I see three things that happen that I think provide evidence of respect and rapport. Whoops. Now, one of, whoa, whoa. <laughs> one of them might also be evidence for something else, like questioning and discussion. Okay? And that's the nature of... Um, Stuff that happens, right? But these things that I've cited, these three things, are evidence for respect and rapport if they satisfy three criteria. If they are accurate and unbiased. Uh, that's one of the things we do in training, incidentally, is training for bias. We all have biases. We just better know what they are and control for them, sort of account for them. And it's got to be just the facts. Just the facts. It has to be relevant. If I say it's about respect and rapport, it is. It might also be about something else. It's got to at least be that. And it's representative of the total. If there were eight things to do with respect and rapport, I wouldn't have just picked the three negative ones. Okay? It's representative. Now, this is a lot of what we do in training. It's just plain identifying what, if you see something that happens, what is it evidence of? Or when you're taking notes, how do you write it as evidence, really evidence and not judgment, or interpretation, opinion, any of those. Don't get yourself in there. 
Now, but as hard as this is to do it, it's, 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 it's challenging. It's the easy part, because the hard part has to do with interpreting that evidence against the levels of performance. I mean, the same events can be interpreted in more than one way. We know this. Any parent knows this. Any teacher actually knows this, right? And so now there is, in the end, there will be a judgment. There will be a judgment. But the, so and that's, we'll talk about that in a second. The interpretation part, here's what the cognitive job is. Those three things that I identified as about respect and rapport, which of these collections of words and the levels of performance best characterizes those three things? Now, when I do an observation, I take my notes, and I give a copy of my notes to the teacher. I give a copy. Because I want them to know, tell me if I got it right, or did I miss something. Okay, so we maybe have to go back and forth on that. But now we have a set of notes that reflect what we both think happened. Now, I go away and I interpret my notes against the levels of performance, right? But here's the key. I ask the teacher to do the same. Same set of notes, same levels of performance. I take a highlighter, frankly. I ask the teacher to do that. Now we come together, we have our conference, and we compare our highlights. Um, that's when then, and, and the, the, the CCSR, who's done this research in Chicago, the first year of the study was about the process. 100% of the teachers found it valuable. And most of the principals. But the principals who didn't were, they didn't like it because it, like they'd say, I, I don't have time to do this well. Actually, what we in fact found is that it takes longer. To, it takes no longer to do it well than to do it poorly. It does take longer to do it well than to not do it at all, which is often a trade-off. But but it, but what everybody says is the value is in the conversation. Period. Now, when we do training, by the way, for mentors, the training is identical up to this point. They just don't make judgments, but they do assess, right? They observe, they assess, they just don't judge. And so I would just offer that to you. So therefore, when we do training in districts, we urge a, the training group to be a mixture of evaluators, coaches, and teachers. It depends on how many training slots there are. Right? But there's no reason why teachers should feel this is somehow secret, privileged, right? And so on. Okay. So you can see this framework's used in all these ways. And what's most powerful is this when, it, when it's used in all of them simultaneously because then they reinforce one another. You get a coherent approach. There are benefits from any framework, my personal favorite being mine, but you know, if you get the same benefits because the big one is common language. We learned this about a hundred years ago from Madeline Hunter. If anybody remembers those days, we were all Hunter on this, right? See, she was, she was a verb too. Right? She was a verb. Um, but we know this, and it's powerful. Every profession has its, its language. Oh, and then, okay, when, I forgot about that one slide in there. Um, when you're observing, uh, when you're evaluating practice, these are your options, basically, right? These are your options. Observations of practice that's teaching and other things that can be observed, like a presentation to a child study team, a teacher conducting a workshop for colleagues, et cetera, right? Anything that can be observed. Conferences, before and after, samples of student work. This is an enormously powerful evaluation. You can see levels of engagement, and you can see rigor when you look at what these kids are being asked to do. National Board discovered this, that when teachers reflect on their experience with the National Board, they always say, this is the best one, the best entry for having to do student work. So anyway, and then artifacts. How do you communicate with families and so on? So designing a system means taking these things from practice. Now, most people start with observations of classroom practice, because that's sort of the quintessential work of teaching. But it is really supplemented by all the behind-the-scenes work. And so to have a comprehensive good system, I think in the end, you have to end up with all that. But if you have to start somewhere and you don't have much yet, I would start with observations of classroom teaching. Now, there are challenges, clearly defining, building understanding and consensus. That's about PD for everybody. Teachers and principals, developing instruments and procedures to capture evidence, training and certifying, <coughs> question mark, I think yes, evaluators, evaluators. And then schools need to structure some their schedules, so there's actually time to have the conversations that everybody knows is important, are important. 
So in summary, both teacher practices and results of teaching are valid indicators of teacher effectiveness. Now you're going to hear more, much more obviously about the, the results. Um, both of them form, pose formidable technical measurement challenges. That we know that the measurement of results does, absolutely, even though the measurement of practices. That is, training is hard. It's, tra it's hard. We, we now have, fortunately, we now have to do that. We, I don't think anybody knows how to do the other, but you'll learn about that. Um, they sh both should be highly evolved before they may, are used to make consequential high-stakes decisions. Some, in some states, you don't have that luxury but I would urge you to press for it. We've got to do this right. We're, people's lives and careers are at stake here. So please, legislatures, let us, give us the time to do this well. But when they're done well, both can yield significant benefits for, for uh, the profession. I mean, they really can. So I'm actually kind of optimistic in the very long run. I'm not that optimistic in the very short run. <laughs> I'm really not. And so there are some resources. That, these are the ones I've just been mentioning. So I've, I bet you will have this now on, on this machine. And so I would urge you to, if you will want it, just ask for it. You're, as far as I'm concerned, you're welcome to it. Uh, it is copyrighted, but it says so. So I've had it. And thank you for your kind attention. I've enjoyed this. Thanks. Thank you.